Troy Pavlik is a software developer and the president of the Hazeldean Community League. Hi, I'm Troy Pavlik and I'm running for City Council in Ward 11. And I want to start off by thanking Richie for hosting this event. Uh, I live just south in Hazeldean and it's nice to be able to walk just a neighborhood north where I'm president of the Community League and I'm a community activist and I can debate civic politics with my peers. That's always great to do. Now if I was to describe myself, I'm a progressive, data-focused, Vision Zero advocate. And I put Vision Zero right in that descriptor because I think it's hugely important. And I think it's past time that someone who actually understood those words was saying them. Uh, this is what inspired me to run. The city needs to be much safer for people walking, much safer for people driving, and much, much safer for people cycling. And the way we get there is by making hard commitments with dates to the necessary infrastructure upgrades that will get us there. We need a mindset shift on our council and our administration, and our leaders need to work toward making Edmonton an urban city where anyone can get safely to where they want to go, regardless of their mode of transportation. Now, I've been accused on multiple occasions of spearheading the war on cars, as it were. Um, and I think that's a tad melodramatic, but if the car is in fact king in Edmonton, I think it's past time for a coup, and let's give it back to the people. <laughs> now, I'm not a one-note candidate. Uh, I have a platform on my website with detailed links to policy I've posted about in the past, and, and I don't really think this should be a differentiating factor, that I'm talking publicly about my opinion, but when you go home and do your research, which I encourage you all to do, I think you'll find that in our work, it sort of is a good differentiator. Now, flipping the page, all right. I won't shy away from taking a leadership position and directing the conversation about Edmonton forward. I'm not going to pander for your votes. If you want a candidate that's going to freeze all taxes and spending, a candidate that's going to make your commute faster by tearing out all the bike lanes and LRT, or a candidate that's going to that will hold Edmonton back from becoming Canada's next big city to watch in order to preserve a way of life that was back in the 70s, well, don't vote for me. I'm not that candidate. I love living in Edmonton, and I'd love to live here 50 years from now. And if I have a seat on council, my vote will be in service of that Edmonton 50 years from now. It's time for Edmonton to grow up. And as a young candidate, if you'll have me, I'd love to grow right alongside it and help Edmonton along its way to becoming that great city 50 years from now. My name is Troy Pavlik, and I hope you'll vote for me on October 16th for your city councillor in Ward 11. Railways in the process of vacating its Strathcona rail yard in favor of a truck and train intermodal facility further to the south. Once this happens, the city will be in a position to extend 76th Avenue through the rail yards and could open it up to all modes of transportation. Would you allow all modes of transportation, trucks, buses, cars, bikes, and pedestrians to use 76th Avenue once it's been extended through the railway rail yards? or would you restrict its usage in some way? I'm a resident of Hazeldean. I live here as well. So if I don't get elected to city council, you might have to watch for me laying down in the roadway that they're trying to get. <laughs> 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 All right, so with that in mind, let's talk about the best case scenario for these rail yards, because we're not gonna get it, but best case is always a good case to dream of. The best case scenario for this rail yard usage is a linear park north-south that allows pedestrians and cyclists to move through, but not vehicle traffic. Like Karen mentioned just a moment ago, if we open up this corridor, we can't close it. It's Pandora's box. People are thirsting for an east-west corridor in Edmonton, and White Ave, you know, it gets congested. 63rd Ave, it, construction is there, it gets more than congested. People will choose 76 app, and that will be patently unsafe for our neighborhood. That is not an arterial road, and it cannot be used as such, and if we open that rail yard to vehicle traffic, it will be used as such. There are options. I think cars should be able to move from our side of the tracks to the other side of the tracks, but driving straight through is not the way to do it. Perhaps there's an area where you enter one side on 76 Ave, you have to detour down beside the linear park, and then you move on and you're exited on 69 Ave on the other side. Something like that to allow vehicle traffic between communities to move in so we can share rich market. I'm out of time, but no, no, I would not. <laughs> um, the next question is on residential speed limits. 
The City of Edmonton will soon have the ability to change the speed limit on all residential roads, thanks to a city charter being developed with the provincial government. Leaving the question of speed limits on main roads and the freeways aside, do you favor reducing the speed limit on residential roads to 30 kilometers per hour, to 40 kilometers per hour, or keeping the status quo? Thanks for the, the starter. Mike, uh, so you won't find a candidate up on this stage that has worked harder for lower residential speed limits than I have. Uh, we actually do have a city policy on reducing residential speed limits. It's policy C566, and it says that if 67% of your community, what does 67% mean to Mike's point, if 67% of your community supports lowering the speed limit, the city will put up the signs and do it. I door knocked everywhere in Hazeldean and I asked the question. And Hazeldeaners, 72% of us support the initiative. That was a year ago, so why hasn't it happened? I'll throw that one back to our incumbent councillor. <laughs> but, lower speed limits absolutely are an important thing to me. I have to raise a bit of quarrel with what I've heard on the stage so far though. There's an oh please think of the children attitude with speed limits. Last I checked, I wasn't a child and I want lower speed limits. And you know what? I don't want it for just the kid down the street. I want it for me. Streets are quieter, they're more livable, I can cycle, I can walk, and you know what? If I want to go play with a soccer ball and it falls into the road, I'm an adult and I can still do that. We need slower speed limits and we need them for everyone. And that's why we need to pursue this initiative. Absolutely, I'm 100% behind it. Area residents have seen a significant increase in traffic at the corner of 76th Avenue and 96th Street in Ritchie. To the point where pedestrian space safety has become a concern. What would you do to improve pedestrian safety at this intersection? So in my opening notes, I talked about you know my general stars on my label and my war against cars. Uh, there's an important consideration with a four-way stop that's often overlooked. At a four-way stop, the pedestrian is king. That's important. And when we look at Ritchie Market, what was our intention? Our intention was to increase street life, to increase pedestrian activity, and to increase vibrancy of that area. We've done it. That's what, yeah, yay, yeah. applause, there we go. <laughs> We've done it, and now we're talking about, well, let's talk about making the cars move faster by putting in a traffic light. At a traffic light, the cars are king. You press the button and you beg to cross the road. That's not an acceptable solution here, and I, I would not push for a traffic light. That said, pedestrian safety is a concern, and it's part of Vision Zero. There are so many infrastructure solutions that we could pursue here. My preferred option is keep the four-way stop and raise the crosswalks. Raise crosswalks function just like speed bumps. It causes drivers to slow down and stop and look both ways before they drive through. We need pedestrians to have priority access at the intersection in front of Ridge Market. We need pedestrians to be safe, and we need the engineering solutions that accomplish that. And those are my criteria for solving that intersection. Thank you. In order to make housing more affordable and increase the density of our older neighborhoods, the city has been allowing a variety of forms of infill housing, including skinny houses, garage suites, and laneway homes. Are you comfortable with the city's rules around infill housing? If not, what needs to change? So let's start with addressing the premise of the question. In order to make housing more affordable and increase the density was what was asked. Um, if you take a $350,000 bungalow with a main floor suite and a basement suite, you tear it down and you throw up uh, two $550,000 duplexes, you've accomplished neither. So that's what we need to be looking at. If we are looking at the goal of having housing more affordable and increased density, then we need to do that. If our goal is to increase the value of homes in a neighborhood and make nicer McMansions for people to live in, then we need to keep the strategy going as we're currently going. I credit our mayor with his leadership on this initiative. We need to target the missing middle of housing. For example, look in Hazeldean. We recently had a four-story apartment building appear in the middle of this RF1 single-family ocean of houses and it was completely in character of the neighborhood. How did they accomplish that? Well, that four-story apartment building is surrounded by a bunch of row housing, which is both affordable and dense. We need to make our zoning more efficient and more practicable for developers to build row housing, to build courtyard housing, to build stacked row housing and brownstone housing. All these sort of housing forms that we don't see anywhere in the city, and you'll see in urban metropolises across the country, in Toronto, in Montreal, and Vancouver, 
because they need it. That's how you grow as a city, and that's how you uh, create a livable city with gentle density through missing middle housing. And that's what we need to be targeting. Thanks. Edmonton City Council has approved tax increases that are higher than inflation almost each and every year over the past decade. This has put financial pressure on many homeowners, particularly seniors on fixed incomes. What, if anything, would you do to reduce city spending and rein in this increase in city tax rates? Mike handed me the question on residential speed limits. I'm going to hand this question to him. He's probably going to handle it better. Let's talk about costs. Uh, the Anthony Hende, $40 billion. The Yellowhead, we're going to spend a billion dollars, collectively $510 million coming from the city, upgrading it into a freeway. Roads are expensive. Where do you think your taxes go? When we talk about reduction in taxes, we had a tax freeze, as Karen mentioned, for many years, and our infrastructure crumbled. A lot of these tax increases we've had have been to support the Neighborhood Renewal Program. Increases every year to fund the many millions of dollars to rehabilitate the roads and sidewalk in neighborhoods. Now, if we had less of those, would we have to spend money? That's the question I pose to you. Now, in April of 2014, uh, the city released a, or, sorry, April of this year, the city released a white paper on user fees. In that white paper, it said that transit generates $700 million in benefits. We invest from city subsidies $200 million of money into transit every year. That's a two and a half times return on investment annually on transit. Now, why are we investing all of our city tax money into roadway infrastructure to support more private car usage that needs more roadway infrastructure with more tax revenue when we could get people on buses, on transit, and LRT, and we could avoid this problem entirely? I'm not going to cut your taxes. I'm going to use your taxes better. Thanks. <laughs> The City of Edmonton officials are planning an LRT line from Bonnie Doon to the University of Alberta. They are seriously looking at running it down White Avenue and plan to select an alignment later this fall. Do you favor running an LRT line down White Avenue? If not, what other route would you prefer? So I'll just install my bed on 76 Avenue, just nap there for all the city projects. <laughs> it's not going down 76, but I think it's important to clear up a couple of misconceptions with this project. First, we have LRT planned extensively. This project is not going in tomorrow, it's decades in the future. And decades in the future, White Avenue and downtown are going to be different places. The justification for this line is that we're going to have dense populations along White Avenue and dense populations downtown, and we want to circulate population. That's why they call it the circulator. And that's a valid goal, and I think that's something we should be planning for as a city. Now, those of you that will follow me will know that I was railing really hard on BRT this week because a lot of candidates were proposing BRT. In this specific case, BRT, bus rapid transit, might be a great solution along White Ave. We already have very good bus service along White Ave. We install dedicated lanes for buses, and we have the LRT Valley Line that's going to be at Bonnie Doon. We have the Capital Line of Health Sciences. If we install fast, efficient bus connections between those, it might alleviate the need for LRT entirely, and that's something we need to consider. Thanks. The City of Edmonton is looking at the possibility of restoring Mill Creek between 92 Avenue and the river. At an estimated cost of between $80 million and $120 million, this would create a new creek and parkway next to the Mudard Conservatory while allowing fish and other aquatic animals to once again enter the stream and improve the overall quality of the water. Most of the cost is associated with roadway realignments and bridge structures to create a new pathway for the creek. Would you like to see the city proceed with this project? So, for everyone playing the election night drinking game, uh, get out your drinks, I'm about to mention potholes. Uh, Edmonton has the largest river valley system and urban forest in North America. Many of us don't know it, but our river valley is a treasure, and it's a unique treasure to have something of this size. Now, city councils of the past, the big election issues have been potholes. Fix the potholes on our road. Now, this $80 million to $120 million, you know, you can add plus minus 50 or 60 percent. It's a range. We don't have enough data to say exactly what this project is going to cost or look like. 
But with the size of our river valley, is this not fixing the potholes of our nature? This is going to add new fish spawning, new trail systems, new abilities for people to enjoy the river valley at the new Mutar Valley Line stop. I think investments in our river valley, which is chronically underinvested in, is natural sense. And I support, in principle, this project. I really am excited to see the report come back with more details. Thanks. Last question. We have time for one more question. It's on bike lanes. <laughs> the okay. city of Edmonton has recently created a series of bike lanes physically separated and protected from the vehicles in the downtown area. Would you like to see this network extended to other parts of the city, including Richie? Mm. Confirm. 90 seconds isn't enough, so I will say yes, absolutely yes, come talk to me later. Now, let's use these 90 seconds to talk some facts about bike lanes. The downtown bike grid costs $7.2 million. Now, that's a lot of pricing. These cyclists should clearly be registered and insured paying that check. Well, no, 4.5 million of that was for signal upgrades to benefit drivers and ensure their commute was smoother. That's right, the majority of the bike lane budget was spent on drivers. Do the most Edmonton thing you can do. <laughs> Let's talk about bike lanes. There were 7.8 kilometers of downtown bike grid installed. Paths for People, the group that was instrumental in installing this, wants another 7 kilometers of bike grid protected, high quality infrastructure, not like the junk we have on 97th Street, installed across the city every year. I say, why not 14? It's a case where bike lanes are not, like we said, an us versus them mentality. If you look on 100 Ave, the metrics are already coming in. 13% of the mode share on 100 Ave is cyclists. That means of all vehicle traffic, 13% is cyclists. We went from five lanes down to four, and not only did cyclists not get their fair share of money, they got less, cyclists also made up most of the mode share on that road. Cycling infrastructure works, every city has it, Amazon demanded it to come to Edmonton. Can we grow up, please? Thank you. <laughs> Great debate. Thank you all for coming and thank you guys. We're going to give everybody two more minutes to wrap up, make some closing statements. So I want to extend a big thanks out to everyone here for listening and being engaged. Uh, our, mun our municipal elections have abysmal voter turnout. So the fact that each and every one of you came out tonight is important. Decisions are made by those who show up and you guys are here. So give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> Now, I'll openly admit to this. For my debate and campaign prep, my default go-to is watching the West Wing. Uh, it transports me briefly into a Sorkin-esque utopia where people run through hallways talking at hyperspeed. In reality, people are usually making decisions around tables. But one area where this show really nails it is with the concept of 10-word answers. Complex issues can rarely be answered in 10 words, in a convenient speech at the door, in a sound bite. Complex issues have nuance. The complex issues are gray, with a wide range of solutions that would all probably work. For every problem, there is a solution that is clear, simple, and wrong. I'm, going to, I'm not going to solve every problem in Edmonton. I'm not going to fix every failing of our city administration. What I will give you is clear and open, principled stances. I'll give you justifications based on science and good urban planning. I'll give you a voice for Edmonton 50 years from now, not one anchored in the past. And I'll give you leadership that doesn't require supervision or hand-holding. I hope you'll let Pavlik be Pavlik, and I hope that me, up here, without hiding behind platitudes or pandering, will have your vote on October 16th. My name is Troy Pavlik, and it's been a pleasure talking to all of you tonight. Thank you.